All right, uh, go ahead, uh, Chloe. You may uh, introduce Pierre. Yeah, okay. Um, hi, everyone, welcome in. So it is my pleasure today to introduce the seminar speaker. So Pierre Lau is currently a USDA uh, NIFA pre-doctoral fellow. He's focused on using honeybee foraging to better understand their nutritional preferences, specifically protein to lipid ratios within pollen resources. And um, he's also doing this fellowship while continuing his PhD. So you're, he's almost wrapped up his PhD, but it's kind of this transitionary position that he's in. So his PhD advisor is uh, Dr. Juliano Rangel. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Environmental Systems from the University of California, San Diego. And Pierre started his work in pollination research about 10 years ago when he started working with native bee pollination efficiency on watermelon agro agrosystems. So since that time, Pierre has been researching various aspects of honeybee health with an emphasis on nutrition. Pierre is extremely collaborative. He will get involved in any different area of honeybee and nutrition research. So he collaborates on a lot of projects, um, like as far as like genetics and in ants and in native bees. Um, and he's also, if any of you have been in any of my classes and I talk about ESA presentations, and there's like always one that I think is like one of the best presentations always, it's Pierre. So he's a fantastic presenter. And he also has a lot of uh, teaching experience too, um, which probably helped. So I'll hand it over to you, Pierre, and thank you again for, for agreeing to come. Well, thank you, Chloe, for the introduction, and thank you for the Rutgers Department of Entomology for having me and inviting me to the seminar. Um, and way to go, Chloe, for just upping all the pressure for my presentation. Um, but today I'll be talking about some of my work on bee nutrition throughout my PhD. And this is my, um, usually my start, my, my very first slide where I start off talking about all different things that are affecting honeybee health. And I like using this image, one, because my undergraduate advisor, Dr. James Knight, UC San Diego, used this. And I thought it was really cool. This was um, an image that was first drawn in 2008. Um, when colony collapse disorder was at its peak and people really did not know what was going on. Um, so even though um, CCD is no longer as um, much of an issue and we have a better idea of what's happening, a lot of the parts of this image is still relevant in today's beekeeping industry. So in particular, this one uh, that stands out the most is um, pesticides. We see pests and parasites here, which can be vectors of different pathogens and uh, viruses and diseases for honeybees. We see landscape change that can include agricultural um, intensification and also urbanization. And the part that I'm most interested in is poor nutrition. Um, but even though I'm really um, mainly interested in poor nutrition, um, you, you'll see throughout this presentation aspects of other um, honeybee health um, uh, uh, stressors that, of honeybee health that I incorporate in my studies and my research program. Um, so you'll see a little bit of the pests and parasites work that I'm involved with and the pathogen stuff, and then also the um, pesticide research and landscape change. But the main reason why I'm so interested in bee nutrition um, is depicted in this graph here. This was a paper that came out from Dr. Jamie Ellis's lab at University of Florida. And part of um, this uh, study includes a uh, longitudinal study of honeybee colonies over the summer dearth period. So they had these different bee colonies where they gave them different pollen substitutes, which are um, artificial diets that beekeepers give to bees. And they compared the growth over a period of 12 and a half weeks um, compared to this yellow line here, which is natural wildflower pollen, and the negative control, which is this purple one hidden um, within all these other lines. So what this screams to me is, that there's still a lot of information that we still do not know about poly, um, um, bee nutrition. Um, a lot of these poly artificial pollen substitutes um, do not compare to the efficacy of natural pollen when bees go out to collect them. Um, so Dr. Jerry Wright says this perfectly in her review paper, the nutritional basis of pollen supplements is poorly understood and a more uh, rational approach based on honeybee ecology and physiology is needed. So if a beekeeper were to ask me if they should feed, um, which pollen substitutes they should feed, 
Um, I find it really difficult to recommend a specific product. Um, one, because I'm, I'm not going to advocate for one company over another. And two, um, in terms of the data, it's very, um, it's very hit or miss in terms of how effective it really uh, can be for bee colonies. Um, so economically, it might not make sense for them to, um, uh, to feed their bees and pollen artificial pollen substitutes. So this is a schematic from Dr. Jerry Wright's paper. It shows the general resource flow of a honeybee colony. So I've done a little bit of work on uh, water foraging um, when I was in San Diego, and I've done some work on nectar foraging here at Texas A&M. But here in this presentation, I'm mainly going to be focused on the pollen foraging, um, so the pollen aspect of bee nutrition. And that's because pollen is the main source of protein and lipids for honeybees. And really, this is a currency that is essential for honeybee growth and development um, because um, this pollen is essential for um, for brood rearing, so developing the, the younger bees in the, in the colony itself and developing the adult, the young adult workers, the nurse bees glands that are used to secrete the food that the bees will end up consuming. So when I first got to Texas A&M, I actually came in as a master's student and the first project I was working on is to identify the main floral sources that provide urban hun and suburban honeybees with pollen in four different um, regions of the United States at a spatial and temporal scale. So really the first question was, what are bees collecting? And this was a part of a larger project um, in collaboration with different universities across the nation, as well as um, our funding source, which is Bayer Crop Science and Syngenta. And the overall scope of, of this was to um, really look at how, if pesticides and, and other insecticides are um, being um, are, that are being used in the urban environments are being um, put into the are being exposed to the flowers that the bees are collecting. So my main portion of this is going to be what the bees are collecting. Um, so I'm not going to talk too much about the pesticide portion. That paper is currently in review right now. But we had four different study sites here, and um, we uh, first looked at identified our different sites for. That we're going to sample from and this was a giant citizen science project across the entire nation where each um, university or location or the research um, uh, stations from each um, location identified work with the beekeeping communities within each um, area and identified beekeepers wanting to participate and they had to be in an urban or suburban area which i believe was um what we defined it was an air, uh, the, bee, the surrounding landscape was over 60 percent impervious layer uh, based on the national land cover database so once we identified those, um, um, those beekeepers, we sampled from them over the course of a year and a half. And I received a bunch of pollen samples and we did, we used a tool called palynology, um, which is the study of pollen. And we identified the pollen grains that honeybees are collecting from these different environments um, using light microscopy. So part of this involves using acids to break down pollen grains because um, in order to identify these pollen grains, you have to use a physical and morphological characteristic similar to identifying insects and using a dichotomous key. We do the same thing for pollen. Um, the really fun thing about them is we can kind of play forensics here because since each plant produces its own specific and unique pollen grain for that um, particular plant, um, you can kind of play CSI and forensics and look at the pollen that the bees collected and trace it back to a plant original plant that they collected it from. Um, so we have, it's pretty important to process this pollen. I won't go into detail on this methods, but when you don't um, process it with acetolysis, which is basically a nine in one solution of acetic anhydride to sulfuric acid, um, you would get pollen that's um, really indistinguishable. But once you process it, um, you would get pollen. Um, you start to see some of the morphological characteristics a little bit more um, clear. Um, and even though Dr. Bryant, which um, is one of my community members that just unfortunately passed away earlier this year. Um, he would say that these pollen grains are overstained. Um, they're still, I can still identify them to at least a family or genus level here in this specific um, image. So here's an example of like a slide that I would see in one of the pollen samples. This large pollen grain here at about 90 microns long, it's going to be magnolia pollen. The smaller one here is pollen from the willow tree. And then you have crepe myrtle pollen here and you have sweet clover. In the um, corner. 
And just to highlight a few other pollen types in, in the case, in case this is your first time seeing them, um, these two pollen types here are part of the rosaceae family. Those large ones part of the prunus family or uh, genus. And then you have um, oak pollen here. You have lilac pollen, uh, sumac pollen, pollen from the daisies and weeds, and you even have sweet gum pollen here. So they can look completely different from one another, which is how you can um, identify to its, um, uh, the plant it came from. So we ended up coming up with a very pretty large data set um, with each location and each um, season. We broke it down to, we highlighted the most dominant pollen types in each location um, by the season. And then um, in the supplementary information, you can find the specifics of what pollen types um, were found and along with their relative abundance. But just to summarize some of the findings, um, as expected, we saw the highest diversity of pollen in the spring. Um, this is different from an, an other studies in Europe um, where they found the highest diversity in the summer because of um, geographical differences. Um, and we also, uh, but the two of the more interesting studies I found were that um, bees were actually more likely to go for trees and shrubs. And those are a very important pollen source for um, honeybees in the late winter slash early spring. So um, earlier, and at least for Texas, it would have been like February, March, um, that, that period of time, you would see a lot of the rose shrubs blooming, a lot of the willow and oak trees um, blooming and bees would be collecting pollen from there. And this was something that surprised me when I was doing this project, because when you think of forage for honeybees, I usually think of the herbs that you would see on the ground. And another thing that stood out was the low taxonomic diversity um, that was found in the summer. And a lot of that was because, um, at least in Texas and Florida and the southern states, um, they, um, it gets so hot here that it becomes really dry and there really isn't much um, um, uh, flowering plants out there for bees to collect from. That's why that Jamie Ellis paper from the University of Florida did their um, study during the summer dearth um, where there wasn't much um, resources for bees to collect from. Um, so this low taxonomic diversity suggests that there is a possible summer dearth. So if there um, is something that you can do to help bees, um, it would be to supplement them with resources and nutrition throughout, throughout this period of time. And another thing that was interesting that was during the summertime, one of the predominant pollen types that was found was crepe myrtle pollen um, uh, from the crepe myrtle tree. And one of the um, suggestions that a and uses for um, controlling crepe myrtle pests such as a um, bark scale is to use insecticides um, such as systemic insecticides and neonicotinoids. And there, are, there can be implications to, um, to that type of research um, because, or um, those type of insecticide usages because of the, um, the high dependence of honeybees on these specific plants throughout this period of time. So there's, there will be more information talking about this in the other paper that's currently in review, so I won't um, talk about this too much. But following that study, uh, the next question was whether or not there was a nutritional basis for falling, uh, pollen foraging. So are bees collecting pollen um, based on what's available out there, or do they actually have preferences? So to answer this question, I started collaborating. Um, I added, this was uh, the main part of my PhD when I transitioned over. So I added Dr. Spence Beamer um, to my committee and I started working a lot with, um, I, it's, I'm probably gonna slip at some point, but I call him French Pierre, but there's another Pierre in the department. Um, his name's Pierre Len, Dr. Pierre Len. Um, but we just refer, I just refer to him as French Pierre. So if I accidentally, um, just let that slip. Um, that was the reason why. But I worked with him a lot to look at the geometric frame, to use a geometric framework on, uh, for nutrition to study how, um, how honeybees balance their nutrient intake. So this framework is basically a state space modeling approach to explore how animals solve the problem of balancing multiple nutrients. So in this example here from Beamer's review paper, you have a bicoordinate plot with carbohydrates on the uh, y axis and proteins on the x axis. So in this example, this organism is given two diets, one that's high in carbohydrates and low in uh, protein, and another one that's very high in protein and low in carbohydrates. This red point here is op optimal intake target for the um, organism to achieve uh, maximum uh, growth or fitness, depending on what its physiological state is. So this intake target can change depending on what the goals of the organism is. So if the goals of the organism is to reproduce, um, this, this point can shift. So it really depends um, on the current state of um, what the organism's in. But in this specific example, 
this organism do not, does not have a straight path to this optimal intake target. Um, so instead, this organism will consume these two diets at different proportions and navigate itself to this intake target where it will achieve maximum, maximal growth and fitness. And this tool is um, used to determine the macronutrient ratios to how, and how that affects survival and physiology. And most of the time, um, it's used for both uh, proteins and carbohydrates. So um, this tool is commonly used for co um, conservation efforts. So one of the, uh, two of the first people that started developing this tool was David Robinheimer and Stephen Simpson. And one of the studies that they did was on the New Zealand cockapo parrot. Um, so this is just an example I'm bringing up to see how this can, how to show you how this can be applied. So this parrot is known as, it's an endemic parrot um, to New Zealand and it was critically endangered at one point. It's also known as the world's fattest parrot. And these conservators are trying to um, support them by um, keeping them there and feeding them the supplementary feed to the parrots. Unfortunately, these parrots were not reproducing. They were just there, they're barely managing and they, the people there could not get them to reproduce. So once, these, uh, once uh, Stephen Simpson and uh, Dave Robinheimer came in and applied the geometric framework for nutrition, they looked at the natural diet of this kakapo parrot and they compared um, the different nutrients of the rimu berry, which is what they uh, normally eat. And they found that the natural, the, the natural diet was completely different com compared to the supplementary feed that the conservatory uh, was feeding them. So the protein to lipid ratio of that supplementary feed was completely different and it did not have enough calcium compared to the, um, their natural diet. And calcium is a very important nutri uh, nutrient for birds because they need that to develop the egg, uh, the egg shells um, whenever they are trying to reproduce. So this was as of 2019, so two years ago. Um, so, um, but that study was done, I think in the early 2000s, um, but um, these parrots are still here. And uh, as a matter of fact, two years ago, they had one of the best breeding seasons on record, um, partly because of, um, um, the work that they did. So um, my whole research objective going into this PhD is use this tool and apply this for honeybees to determine an optimal honeybee macronutrient ratio in artificial diets that beekeepers can effectively use to um, supplement their colonies. So we created these diets, um, which were contain protein, lipids, sugars, and a lot of other ingredients I'm not going to um, um, get into detail with. And um, we created a range of diets um, ranging in proteins to lipid ratios, and these values were based on the published literature on bee, um, bee pollen and bee bread. So we have, so the first number here is a protein, and the second number is the, the amount of lipid. So this is an important thing for you to note for the, uh, the rest of this presentation. And developing act this actually took um, quite, quite a lot of time because um, there isn't anything that I can, that I was able to use um, to start off. Um, so this was basically made from scratch. And this was actually one of the first diets that, um, that we're able to use as um, a, a diet that where we can manipulate the protein and lipid ratios um, for honeybees and test how that affects them. So for our first experiment, we did a no choice test. So we caged one day old bees in cohorts of 30. We chose these uh, young bees so we can track their age. We weren't targeting nurse bees because nurse bees are the, is, is a group that, um, that they're the group that um, consumes the most um, um, pollen and they're the ones that need to develop the hypopharyngeal glands to, in order to feed the brood. So we first did a no choice test with one of the five diets for a negative control. And then we also measured the bee physiology. So we looked at the total lipid content and hypopharyngeal gland size. So the hypopharyngeal gland size um, is a really important indicator for bee nutrition. And um, basically the larger the size of the hypopharyngeal glands are the, um, um, the higher the nutritional status of those nurse bees um, have been. So um, this was, so this no choice test really was a test of functional significance of these different diets. So when we gave the bees these different diets, um, one thing that stands out right away is that when they're given a 30-20 diet, they consumed the most diet. But just based on this graph, we cannot say that they prefer consuming diets of 30-20 because we're not um, giving, uh, um, it's not showing preferences at all. Okay, so after we did that, we looked at the, how the bees responded to the diets that we gave them. So this first graph here is the hypopharyngeal gland sizes, and there was a positive correlation in the red line 
um, with the protein that they consumed and how large the hypophrangeal gland sizes were, depending on um, the amount of the type of diets that they were given. Okay. So since the bees ate the most 30-20 diet, they had access to the most protein, which was correlated to how large hypophrangeal gland sizes were. Um, so these three were similar. They weren't significantly different, but the three of them were uh, significantly uh, larger than the higher lipid diets. We didn't see a difference in the total lipid content. And um, initially, this was a little bit surprising, but after looking into it in a little bit more detail and talking to uh, uh, other um, to Vanessa Corby Harris from uh, USDA in Arizona. She also saw something similar with her experiments where she didn't see a large difference in lipid content. And uh, there can be two reasons for this. One, um, we ran these experiments for uh, about six or seven days. So um, there isn't enough time for these differences to really um, take in, to, for us to see these differences. And two, the bees were given at lib um, sucrose solution. So insects can convert sucrose to lipids and um, they can end up storing it in the fat body. Um, so since they had the sucrose solution, they can actually convert that um, into the fat body. So since, um, that's probably another reason why we didn't see any differences there. But the um, real interesting graph and part of this story um, comes in this graph here. Um, once again, this is the bicoordinate plot that I showed you an example of. Okay, so we have protein on the x-axis and lipids consumed on the y-axis per bead. Each one of these dotted lines represents a nutrient rail, um, similar to the same lines that we saw earlier. So these lines were basically drawn on based on the slope of a diet. Okay, so since the bees were only given um, one of these diets, so uh, they can only stay on this rail. They cannot move and navigate away from it. So for example, the bees given a 35-15 diet can only, will consume this diet, but will stay on this rail here. Okay, whereas the bees given a 1535 diet will, uh, will only move along this rail based on the consumption. The interesting part here is when you look at these three intermediate diets, okay, you see that they line up here and there's no differences in lipid consumptions um, among these three diets. And so what that tells us is that there can be, uh, there is a lipid in, uh, regulation with these three intermediate diets. So bees given these three diets, they consume the diets up until they hit around 1.8 milligrams per bee before they end up um, slowing down the consumption of these diets. So that tells us that there can be some lipid regulation going on within these three diets. With the 1535 and 3515, these two diets are likely too extreme for the bees to get to this point. So this one's way too high in lipids. Bees didn't really like eating this at all. And this one was a little bit too high in protein. Um, so when the bees were consuming this, it would stop here and they can't reach this level. So if they wanted to reach 1.8 milligrams of lipids, they'd have to consume over 4 milligrams of lipid per bee. And we know from studies in ants that overconsuming um, um, protein can actually be fatal to organisms. And we see that in, other in some of my other work in, um, in bees as well, too. Oops. So then we moved on and we started doing, we decided to do a choice test where we had three different treatment groups and we paired um, three different, uh, uh, two diets with one another to look at their preferences and see if they can regulate the nutrients. So the first one was a pairing of 30, 20, and 20, 30. And then we had a pairing of 15, 35, and 20, 30, and then a pairing of 15, 35, and 25, 25. So for our first pairing here, when bees were given 30-20, they consumed significantly more of that compared to the 20-30. When bees were given a 35-15, they went for the higher protein diet once again, and they consume, consumed more of 35-15 compared to the 20-30. And then when bees were given 35-15 and 25-25, there is no difference in consumption. So just looking at this, it's really hard to really interpret what this really means. But I'm going to move this over to the side. And I'm going to bring up this bicoordinate plot for us to dive, like, inspect this a little bit closer. So once again, we have your protein and your lipids on the x, y axis. And you have our four nutrient rails. We didn't include 1535 here because it was just so high in lipids that the bees just didn't like it. They didn't eat much of it at all. So the interesting thing here is that um, we'll start with this triangle. Okay, So when you pair 3515 and 2525, um, the bees did not consume these any different, um, did not significantly consume them differently uh, between one another. So they consumed them to a point where they regulated um, 
uh, uh, protein lipid, so they were at 3020. So they fell right on this line, this new chain rail of 3020. Okay, so moving on to the circle one, or the circle treatment group where we're looking at 3515 and 2030, where one where, where the bees consume significantly more 3515 compared to 2030. The bees here, once again, consume both of these diets at a different proportion this time though, but landed also right exactly on this 3020 nutrient rail. And this tells us that they're, they're, they are, they can, they are uh, regulating the proteins and lipids that they are consuming. So in a perfect world, um, in this diamond group, um, they wouldn't eat any of this 2030 um, diet, and instead they'll eat only of this third, only this 3020 diet, and they'll also land along this nutrient rail. But um, um, unfortunately, um, the story is not going to be um, <laughs> that perfect to that extent. Um, they did eat a little bit of 2030 diet, so it shifted their protein lipid intake um, slightly to the left, where it's a little, a little bit more biased towards lipids. But when you look at other papers, um, such as um, Dr. Beamer's grasshopper work, this is natural. Um, when bees were given these diets, it's natural for them to uh, experiment with um, the different diets that are given to them. And um, what they end up doing is they just increase the frequency of, a, of consumption of the diets that they do like more than the other ones. And when you, when you, want, when you tie this back into the no choice test that we talked about earlier, 3020 was the one that the bees most readily consume and consume the most diet from when they were given compared to all the other ones. So currently in the literature, um, I haven't mentioned this yet, but um, everything is all about protein. Um, it's all about marketing um, high protein diets for bees. And this can be why um, we see that the pollen substitutes are not nearly as effective because if bees were really trying to maximize protein, we would see them consuming um, significantly more 3515, but that's not the case here. Instead, we see that uh, they're consuming significantly more of this um, sec uh, in intermediate diet of 3020. So moving forward to this, we wanted to take this out to the field on, uh, and test this on the natural um, field conditions and colonies um, where they're given uh, uh, different pollen types using natural resources. So our first one is oilseed uh, rape, which is also known as brassica nathus or canola pollen. As a combined protein and lipid content of 53% and the overall protein and lipid ratio of 1.2 to 1. And then we also had wild rose pollen, which is a combined protein and lipid content of 38%, but the PL ratio is also very similar to um, oilseed rape um, or brassica, which is 1.2 to 1. So basically what we have here is we have two pollen types that are similar in protein and lipid ratio, okay? But a rosa pollen, has um, significantly, well, has less um, overall protein lipid content compared to um, uh, brassica pollen. Uh, so this figure here just shows um, that the distribution of the carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids that we um, analyze from these pollen types. I'll get into this a little bit more detail later on. But we um, did this out in the field where we cage nucleus colonies, which are small um, colonies um, where we can um, experimentally um, control. And we caged them and we gave them, uh, we also did a choice and no choice assay with the brassica and rosa pollen. So since um, they have a similar protein lipid ratio, there are two um, hypotheses we can um, go by. One is that they will consume uh, um, a similar amount of both protein and uh, not they will collect a similar amount of both um, brassica and rosa pollen because they have a similar ratio. And two, um, it's possible that the bees would collect more rosa pollen compared to brassica because brassica is more dense in nutrients compared to rosa, so they would compensate. Um, so the hypothesis is that they can compensate um, by collecting more rosa pollen for the nutrient deficiencies that um, rosa has compared to brassica. Okay, so once again, here is our first experiment where we did a no choice test where the colonies were confined to either brassica or rosa pollen. And what we initially thought was not the case. So instead, bees were consuming or were, were collecting significantly more um, brassica pollen um, compared to rosa pollen. So the first two graphs here is the visitation. So we have behavioral data, and we also have um, the amount of pollen that they collected. And in both cases, um, bees, um, it was a twofold difference so, um, with um, bees that were given brassica pollen. So this tells us that it, um, it might necessarily be the overall protein and lipids uh, ratios that they're going for. Instead, 
there is indication um, from the literature that fatty acids play a very important role in, in um, B, pollen, uh, B pollen preferences and nutrition. So what we did instead was we summed up the total fatty acid content from um, what we analyzed and we plotted protein instead of fatty acids instead. And so what we see instead is that these two nutrient rails will completely diverge from one another. But if we were to have plot the nutrient rails with the protein and lipid um, rate ratios that we have, they would have been very close to one another. And I think I have a graph of that later on. But the, based on the behavior of what we're seeing in the, uh, in the bees and how they're significantly preferring one pollen type over another, um, it does uh, push us to going towards the fatty acids because um, we do see a difference here. And this is what, and this is what we think we're seeing. So in the choice test, we did, we manipulated the frequency of um, Rosa and Brassica in two treatment groups. So in the first treatment group, we have twice as much Rosa compared to Brassica. In the second one, we had twice as much Brassica um, compared to Rosa. So we did this so that we can um, ensure that um, the preferences that we're seeing are actually due to uh, nutritional preferences and not by random chance. And once again, regardless of the treatment groups, regardless of having twice as many rosa compared to um, brassica, um, bees would collect significantly more, will visit and collect significantly more brassica compared to rosa. And we plot this on the bicoordinate plot um, with protein and fatty acids. And you see that um, the two points are basically overlapping one another. So, um, so it shows that there's a very strong regulation and preference for brassica instead of, um, of rosa pollen. So let's look into the fatty acids a little bit more because um, it is something that we are very interested in right now because of some of the um, uh, more recent literature that's come out suggesting how fatty acids can be important for honeybees. Um, so we did a, um, so here are the two um, in panels B and C, we see the two nutrient rails of what would have been uh, if we plotted protein against lipids, the pollen types would not have been very different from one another. So if the bees behaved that way, they, they would um, they, they would be co collecting two pollen types at a very similar rate, or they'd be collecting rosa um, slightly more than brassica to compensate for the nutrition deficiencies in rosa. However, the bees were significantly preferring um, uh, brassica pollen, which leads us to looking into um, why that is and looking into um, the protein and fatty acid uh, ratios instead. And when we do see that, when we do do that, we see um, that these two nutrient rails diverge and which um, leads us to thinking that the fatty acids are actually more important than the total lipids in uh, the pollen itself. So between the two pollen types, we did a PCA and we see very two, two very distinct clusters um, of fatty acids. The green one is the brassica and the um, pink one here is rosa. And overall we see a significantly, uh, brassica pollen has significantly more palmitic acid, oleic acid, and then the lenic acid, which is your omega-3 um, whereas uh, whereas um, rosa pollen has significantly more omega-6, which is linoleic acid. Okay, so um, we've, maybe some of you have heard of the omega-3 fatty acid and omega-6 fatty acid ratio and how that can be important in human diets. Um, so there has been some research from Shroni's lab out in um, Israel, um, who's um, really looking at these ratios and looking at the importance of omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. And what they find, uh, what they've basically found was that diets are high in omega-6 um, fatty acid can actually impair honeybee learning and memory. So, um, so bees given those diets um, actually have a, a harder time learning and remembering um, um, out in the field compared to bees that were given diets that were balanced in omega-3 and omega-6. So the exact balance of how of these uh, of what bees really need between fatty acids, it's still unknown. But in our case here, um, Brassica had signif way, uh, significantly more um, omega-3 compared to omega-6 fatty acids compared to rosa, which was a one-to-one -one ratio. So just a quick re recap on this portion of the experiment. Um, so bees prioritize lipid regulation in intermediate diets. Um, so we see that the 3515 diet may be too high in protein and the 1535 diet may be too high in lipids. In the field test, bees significantly preferred the brassica pollen, um, possibly because of the fatty acids. Um, and we also see us, um, and with these findings, it's substantially different than the protein lipid ratios currently known in literature. Um, and we now know that macronutrient balance is really important and we should consider looking at fatty acids um, 
more in future work. And there are many other aspects of uh, nutrition that is, um, we still need to understand. But in terms of how this can apply directly, I'm gonna bring back this um, graph here that we saw earlier. Um, we see that a natural pollen outperforms all the other pollen substitutes. This is just a screenshot of some of the different pollen um, substitutes available for bee, uh, beekeepers in the market. A lot of them are marketed as high protein, ranging from like 40% to 50% protein and less than two or 5% lipids. So the protein lipid ratios are completely off than, uh, than what we're finding. But we're trying to go beyond that now and um, trying to look at how nutrition can also interact with other stressors. So there has been some research um, that's looked into the interaction between nutrition and um, pathogens, such as these two papers here and how diverse pollen sources can improve <coughs> honeybee immunocompetence and susceptibility to this should be two, um, two diseases. Um, and then um, there is um, other work showing the importance of fatty acids and how that can play a role in inhibiting some bacterial pathogens. One of the ones that's really common is European fowl brood. And um, that, that pathogen is usually uh, corresponded to poor nutrition in honeybee colonies. And um, to tie everything in with another um, a study from, um, done on fire ants, a paper in 2018 found that when bees were infected with fire uh, with the Solanicta invictus virus one, um, uh, these uh, these ants are infected with this virus actually shifted their diet. So they actually preferentially um, consumed diluted honey and, and potato chips, so high carbohydrate diets over a high protein or high lipid uh, foods uh, such as tuna and peanut butter. So that was something that was really interesting to us. And one of the uh, main studies that got us asking um, if different macronutrient ratios and honeybee diets can be applied to stress bees and, and can that affect the survivorship, um, bee tolerance, and expression level of genes that's important for growth development and immunity. So a lot of this work is done with Alexandra Payne, who is an NSF graduate research fellow um, in the lab. She is um, the one that's mainly studying social insect pathogens within our lab. So I started working with her and looking at how we can combine some of our research on nutrition and her, um, her work on deformed wing virus, which um, will usually provide or will, will, um, produce this uh, symptomatic response to honeybees where bees would emerge from um, the cell with these crumpled wings where they cannot fly at all. Um, so what we ended up doing, um, so this work here is still in progress. Um, we have most of our data collected, but we're still doing a lot of analyses. Um, so I'm still going to present some of the, um, our methods and some of our um, survivorship data that we've seen so far, because I do think it's very interesting and it does apply to the nutrition work that I'm doing here. So what we did was do we collected workers that were displaying this crumpled wing phenotype because they have very high levels and high titers of deformed wing virus. And we created an inoculum and we screened that they're absent of other honeybee viruses, such as Israeli acute paralysis viruses, et cetera. And then we uh, got the viral copy number of um, DWV using QPCR and created an inoculum where we were able to individually inject um, honeybees with um, deformed wing virus in cages uh, with one um, to uh, 10 to the six viral copies of deformed wing virus. And then we were able to measure consumption and mortality over a period of 16 days. So um, this is just a schematic showing our experimental setup. Um, we have a non-injected group, a PBS injected group, and a deformed wing virus injected group. Um, and uh, based on the results and the research that I just presented about nutrition, we created diets that revolved around our 30-20 diet. So we create a high protein diet, which is 40-10, and a high lipid diet, which is 20-30, and we had a no diet treatment group. And in total, we had 12 treatment groups um, with um, N equals six with 25 Newly, emerging, uh, newly emerged bees per cage. So I mean, um, we, we have um, these inoculation days where um, it literally takes hours because we have to experimentally inject each one of the bees with either non-injected PBS or DWV um, inoculum. Um, and this is just um, some of the images and the methods that we've been doing. So we have this um, giant incubator of all of our different um, diet groups and treatments and experimental treatment groups. Um, here's another schematic showing um, what our cages look like. Um, this is Alex um, injecting the bees, and we have two undergrad undergraduate students, Jordan and Coral, that um, helped us throughout this uh, inoculation day and this experiment. Um, so I'm just going to show some quick survivorship um, data because I don't have too much time. Um, but um, this first graph here is showing survivorship with 
um, bees that were not giving any diets. So this green one here is our negative control. This blue line here is our PBS injected one. And this red line here is our deformed wing virus injected uh, treatment group. Okay, and this was very close, but we didn't see a significant um, effect of the different treatment groups. It's, it was just barely there, um, whether, um, depending on whether they're given uh, the forming virus and they control the PPS. Um, when we gave them diet, we start seeing some pretty interesting differences. So, so when we're giving them 20, 30 um, diets, we see that the bees um, um, had much significantly more mortality when they were given this deformed wing virus inoculum compared to the other treatment groups. Uh, when they were giving this 30-20 diet, this is the one that's really interesting. Um, this here is a DWV one. It actually outperformed um, the other uh, treatment groups of negative control and um, PBS. Um, so yeah, this is an interesting uh, result that we're still trying to uh, interpret and figure out why that is. Um, but it does kind of fit the narrative of um, what we um, previously found. And then um, when we gave them this 40-10 um, diet group, um, this, we saw significantly um, higher mortality with the DWV um, infected group as well. And we calculate the um, Cox proportional hazards. So this basically calculates risk for the bees given these different diets um, and, and treatment groups. And what we found was that bees um, given the, um, oh, first of all, let me, let me backtrack. So overall, we found that there was a significant effect of the treatment itself. So whether they were infected with deformed virus or a, a PBS treatment control or a um, negative control, um, there was also a significant effect of diet and an interaction of um, um, the two of them together. When we look at the risk ratio, um, this basically tells us that um, bees given the 40-10 diet was 1.64 times more likely to die um, com uh, compared to bees given a 30-20 diet. And they're also 1.87 times more likely to die compared to bees not given any diet at all. Okay, so when we go back and think about that um, fire ant paper I talked about, it was really interesting because it does kind of match up there. We see in the fire ants um, that in terms of how they behave, the fire ants actually reduce and change their um, foraging behavior patterns from collecting and consuming higher protein, higher lipid diets uh, to higher carbohydrate diets. Um, it's still speculation right now, but this seems to be something that we're seeing um, in this experiment as well. Um, this was also really interesting here. Uh, in the middle of the experiment, we subsample um, some of our cages and we um, screen for DWV in a sample of bees. We have not done this at the very end of the experiment yet, um, but here are our negative controls. Here is our um, non-infected bees and our PBS. And this is our low molecular weight ladder. Um, the interesting thing here is um, um, we, this is our um, DWV treatment. So here's a DWV band. Um, so in the no diet 2030 and 4010, we see that the bands are showing for the subsample bees when, uh, for DWV. But for whatever reason, we don't know exactly why, um, for 3020, um, the bees that we experimentally infected and inoculated with DWV, it's not showing up here at all. Um, and this reflects the mortality data as well. Um, this is still something that we're still trying to interpret and figure out why um, we are preparing these samples to um, get them sequenced so we can um, compare some gene expression results um, between these different diets. But um, I thought this was something that uh, was pretty cool that I, I wanted to share for this um, seminar. So a lot, I have a lot of um, people and funding sources to acknowledge, um, but these are the two main committee members that have been part of, um, that have had a large part of um, my, the work that I presented here today. Um, and this is Dr. Uh, French Pierre, um, Dr. Pierre Len. He's helped me a lot with um, the nutrition work. He's um, a, a lot of these figures, those beautiful figures in the nutrition part of the um, paper. Um, he helped us create a lot of those. Um, this is Alex and these are two undergrad students. Um, here are our funding sources, and um, we can have some time for questions. Thank you, Pierre. Questions for Pierre. That's great. Uh, I really like the talk. Thank you. Okay, uh, maybe I can ask first. So, Pierre, have you investigated the diet for the larvae? Oh, well, yeah, that's a great question. Um, the larval diets is something that I've been wanting to do. It's on a to-do list um, because at the end of the day, um, 
the growth and development of the bees um, takes place in those larval diets. So um, for my, for I actually applied for the NSF postdoctoral fellowship um, last fall and uh, part of that proposal at one point was to look at um, these larval diets and how we can possibly manipulate that. But throughout this process, I, I realized that it's actually really hard to manipulate larval diets because the proteins and lipids in it are so unique you can't just, um, um, it's really hard to just add um, uh, proteins or add lipids to, uh, to the royal jelly or the brute diet, the larval diet, because the lipids are unique in the form of 10-HDA and 10-HDA, and also the proteins contain a lot of uh, a major royal jelly proteins, which, is, which are both very specific to honeybees. Um, so it is something that I, I have kept in the radar, but it's just, I, I'm trying to figure out how exactly um, I can do that. Okay, thanks. I'm, I'm sorry, this is um, a question here. So um, yeah. I, I have two questions. Let me start okay. with my first one because it's kind of been bugging me from the beginning. Uh, when, okay. when you, when you, in your first uh, slide that you actually showed again at the end, when you say negative control, does that mean you're not feeding the, the, the bees at all? Is that the negative control? Yeah, so negative control is the, um, we're not feeding them any protein lipid diet, but where they do have access to a sucrose solution okay. and water. Okay. All right. Okay. So, so, so what, what that slide shows, like that first, first slide shows that actually not eating um, is not as bad as some of the food that is, that are being provided artificially by the colony owners. Yeah. So this is actually something I'm also really excited about. I, I do want to end up doing uh, uh, working on the future. Um, but um, there is a hypothesis for fertility and longevity. I think there may be something going on here. Um, even though um, worker bees aren't the ones um, reproducing uh, directly, um, unless it's a very special circumstances, um, their form of reproduction can maybe be um, uh, consuming the diet to produce a hypophrenic glands because um, mm -hmm. that's how they feed the um, developing bees because they are altruistic. They are um, part of the larger um, eusocial system. Um, and that's actually, um, you, you, we see this in other papers as well too. Bees can actually survive for months at a time when given just a sucrose solution, a diet, a sucrose diet. They're perfectly fine um, uh, just surviving off of that. Um, but, the carbo but the addition of proteins and lipids, um, it's, it's better for them because they, it can help them with, the, the, with their glandular development, but it can affect them. Uh, I, I think they can affect them in the long term in terms of longevity. So I, and there may be an like, effect that we're seeing here as well. Okay, um, and, and if, if I may, I was just sort of following up on, on uh, Dr. Wong's question was, um, it's, it's really interesting that you're basically saying it's really hard to, to manipulate the larval um, food because it's being basically processed before being provided to the, to the larvae. But, but, it, but I'm, I'm assuming there would be a, a correlation between the, the food that is being provided and and the quality and, and then what actually is what the, the the larval food becomes is that really no so that's kind of my question just wanted a, a quick follow-up on yeah Dr. so that's actually my the my uh, nsf proposal that I basically <laughs> that i submitted so <laughs> um just to kind of track that relationship because i am very interested um okay. in how and in, in the types of food that the nurse bees eating does it translate to um, the brood food that they produce. Um, so some of that was to, uh, that I proposed doing was to look at um, do a proteomic, meta, uh, lipidomic, and metabolomic analysis on um, on on those resources and compare that. So basically, your answer was it's hard to manipulate, but I still want to do it. I just want to do it in a more you know in a yeah. way to do. Got it. Okay. Yeah, Thank you. Th there is a paper that's manipulated the protein carbohydrates. Um, because you can purchase royal jelly, which is um, um, which you can extract, and you can also um, uh, create um, a carbohydrate solution for them. Um, but it's just it, completely different when it comes to lipids because they're so unique too. There's other other people with questions. Yeah, I'll go to yeah. Chelsea first, and then I'll go to Laura. Hi, Pierre. Uh Fantastic talk. I can't wait to talk more with you later with uh, Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, but I want to start off uh, just asking a question um, based on your research here. Um, 
So for your different uh, pollen ratio diets, are you using the same protein source or are you using like these um, like diets from various sources? I'm, I'm more interested in the uh, amino acid content of those uh, proteins. Yeah, so um, the diet source we selected was isolated soy protein. We chose that one because it does have a pretty balanced essential amino acid profile to what bees need. Um, and we kept it very controlled and consistent, which is, um, so with, with these diets that we made, um, it's very, it's pretty unique. It's, it's actually one of the first ones that um, has been made to use experimentally to test these protein with their ratios, because it's been um, uh, just, it, it's hard controlling for all these different variables in natural pollen. So a lot of different studies they would dilute pollen with cellulose to manipulate these ratios instead or add lipid sources. But in this case, um, we use um, these controlled um, artificial diets. Um, it, it's probably not perfect um, just because we still have so much to learn about bee nutrition, but it's gone uh, so far um, already. So it's, it's been working out. Interesting, wonderful, thank you. Thank you. I'll talk to you more later. I don't want to take away okay. from other questions. All right, Laura. Hi, I'll be in the uh, meeting later, but I wanted to ask this before I forget it. Um, so last semester I took insect behavior with Dr. Hawkins and we talked a lot about your work with um, the geometric framework of nutrition lecture that you did. Um, so I was wondering if you think this is something that we could look at in native bee populations as well, or if it's something that you're planning on working on in the future. Um, yeah, so native bees as a whole, I mean, the nice thing about honeybees is it's, they're basically cows or domesticated um, at this point. Um, so it's very easy to um, actually control, uh, have a lot of, to access a lot of bees and to control um, these uh, experiments. But with native bees, a lot of them are solitary. If anything, um, people have done this with bumblebees. And um, the experimental uh, methods are completely different with bumblebees as well. A lot of it um, is based on looking at the types of pollen that they collect and their preferences and analyzing protein lipid ratios um, for that. So actually Anthony Valdo um, actually published a review paper in insects last year and they compiled a lot of research from the types of pollen that um, different types of bees were collecting in particular honeybees, bumblebees, and Osmia bees, and they compared the protein lipid ratios of these different pollen types from these three different groups of bees and what honeybees collect compared to um, bumblebees and, and, and these Osmia bees, they're completely different in terms of the protein lipid ratios, probably because of um, different um, niches in the environment. So there is a way to do it. It's just a lot more complicated than honeybees. Yeah. <laughs> cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Um, I stole your research to teach you about in my class, but yeah. Yeah. I've been outed. Uh, it's honestly I, quite flattering though. But. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer this, but I kind of had a follow up to Laura's question as well with the, um, just uh, I've been looking at uh, mason bees recently and I don't know a lot about them, but um, just like, I, I do believe that they, they're solitary bees and they lay their brood uh, between little like cells, which they then pack with pollen. When they're packing that with pollen, depending on what time of year it is, because they're usually active in the spring, how, is it gonna be a lot harder for them to be able to regulate exactly what kind of pollen they're gonna be able to put in, in each of these cells? And there'd be like a lot of variability between these cells because of just the pollen that's available at that time. So how does that work for, like I, like you were saying, like I know it's really hard to be able to do it for something that's a native bee or a solitary bee because of that, but like would it maybe not as matter as much for these solitary bees based off of just, you know, not having that choice. So that lipid and uh, protein ratio would not necessarily be like as important. Yeah, so the silver lining with working with um, native bees is a lot of them are specialists actually. So um, they're limited to very select diets. So when you, so if you analyze those diets, you can have a really good idea of what their protein lipid ratios um, would be. Compared to honeybees, which are generalists, um, they can collect from a bunch of different plants. And at the end of the day, 
um, after they've collected all the, from all, all these different pollen types, everything will kind of balance out to what um, they're actually going for. At least that's the plan, general plan for generalist um, feeders. Um, so there's that working for wild bees where, um, where there aren't as many resources that you have to really look into. Um, but yeah, um, if you're interested in looking into nutrient regulation with wild bees, I definitely recommend looking into some of the work Anthony Mato has done. Um, he is probably the guy um, doing a lot of that right now. Awesome. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I didn't think about that, that they would be like initially just only foraging on certain like species rather than everything. Right. Hey, so much. <laughs> the, the interesting thing is there's so much variab variability in pollen nutrition that even pollen from the same species um, can vary in the nutritional content depending on its environment. So um, some of um, low, uh, some, something that's really interesting is whether um, even like the different genotypes or different strains of plants of, of uh, canola pollen can have completely different protein and lipid and maybe even fatty acid ratios compared to um, an, um, a canola pollen from another area. So some of the data that we presented, um, even though we have data for brassica pollen, um, it looks it can look completely different to some of the other um, brassica data in brassica pollen in terms of the nutrient content. Would you think that would have to do with um, the soil quality that maybe it's being grown in or like the fertilizer used and that could manipulate its nutritional? Yeah, there can be a lot of things. Um, it can be an effect of drought, which um, there's been recent papers that have shown that drought can affect uh, the resources that plants produce. Um, maybe even like um, herbicides such as oxen inhibitors, which are known to inhibit the growth of plants that can potentially um, lead to um, uh, lower nutritional quality or, or even qu uh, quantity of pollen produced. So yeah, there can be a lot of different things that affect them. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Dina. Um, so, okay, so that raises this really kind of complicated question about are the bees, so you're giving them, a, you're giving them an option in the, in the laboratory. Um, and does that reflect their history? Uh, with that particular plant? I mean, but they like have a little chemistry lab and they're like, oh, this looks like a good one this time. So let's go for that one. I mean, is this a, a, you know, local adaptation and expectations from a, 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 a population of bees in a particular location that Braska used to be great and we're just gonna keep on using it? How do they assess what's good for them? Um, yeah, in terms of how bees assess um, nutritional quality, um, so there has been some work leading to olfaction, um, the chemical ecology of the actual pollen and the plants that they produce. Um, so if you uh, think about it, the, um, uh, a lot of what bees are attracted to are the lipids in the pollen. Mm -hmm. um, so um, lipids are also, uh, the pollen coat is also very uh, predominant with lipids and different classes and types of lipids as well. And the, a lot of the um, olfaction and the scent um, that comes from um, pollen will come from the, the pollen coat and the lipids itself too. So there, I mean, there's likely an evolution. Uh, you can trace it back to how uh, plants um, evolved with producing these resources to attract pollinators. Um, mm. But yeah, I, I will definitely get to the uh, chemical ecology of this. So this is another field that where nutrition completely intersects um, that I'm really interested in. Got you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Uh, so here, I have a question about uh, the nutrition uh, background. So when you yeah. do the test, what do you fed the honeybees? Uh, for instance, if you fed them with sucrose for 10 days before you do the experiment versus feeding them with sucrose plus protein and others, would that also affect their performance or affect their preference? Yeah, so are you referring to the lab study or the- um, uh, uh, Whatever, the so study? what I mean is, uh, do you think that the nutritional background will oh, affect okay. their preference of uh, the pollen or the flowers? Yeah, so no, that's a great question. A lot of the preference research was actually based around a paper that came out in 2016, once again, from Shoni's lab in Israel. And what they found was that bees can complement nutritional deficiencies in the diet. So let's say that they um, bees collected from um, 
they had a diet that was um, imbalanced for um, certain amino acids. Um, they, they, they collected from that. They were, they were given that diet initially. And after a few days, they switched them um, over to a choice um, treatment, a choice experiment where they had the choice. And bees given the choice um, after given a previously imbalanced diet, they can actually balance and pr they prefer diets that would nutritionally complement um, what they previously had and will balance that out. So that was actually a paper um, that came out in 2016 from, um, Shro uh, from Shroni Shafir's lab, the first authors, um, Harmon Hendrixma. Um, so yes, bees can actually, at least um, in the field, regulate by complementing the resources that they collect. Uh, right. So for instance, uh, you said uh, brassica and rosa. So they like uh, brassica pollen mm -hmm. uh, compared to rosa. So will this uh, preference will last uh, for many days or just uh, temporarily? Um, that is a good question. We only ran this experiment for up to six days. Um, one, because it's hard to find a time, like a period of time where it won't rain and it, when it like we had, I really had to look at a calendar and try to um, time the weather for that. And two, um, by the second day where we can really tell the differences in terms of preferences for um, honeybees um, and what they really like to collect and how they wanted to regulate that. Like possibly in the long run, um, they can adjust the diet if brassica is imbalanced. But there has been a lot of um, research that shows that brassica is actually a very attractive pollen type um, to honeybees. So I don't know how much they would actually um, really um, change and shift their preferences for this specific experiment. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? It's already past the 12. Uh, if not, we'll just stop here. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, thank you all for having me. All right. Uh, din oh, din oh, no question. That's good. All right. So we have a short break, maybe five minutes, and then we'll go back and discuss with students. I'll see you later, Pierre. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Of course. Thank you.